Mr. Singh, I'd like to start out by asking you a few quite straightforward and direct questions. Please could you tell me when you first met Salim Issa? Um, as I quite, uh, I mean, I've already stated in my testimony, um, I can't um, remember exactly when. And All right, to, to, jolt, to jolt your memory, because this, this amnesia is becoming problematic, could you describe what your relationship was with Mr. Salim Issa? Um, as I've said in my testimony already, I met with uh, Mr. Essa maybe uh, two or three times. Um, it was for short meetings uh, associated with uh, any business opportunities. Um, we never ever discussed anything relating to Trillion, uh, not that I can recall or remember. And I should remember that, that was uh, relatively recently. Um, and we never discussed any ESCOM or, or uh, trans Transnet business at all. Okay, well, that's a bit strange because you were at Transnet then at ESCOM and you, you met with them for business-related issues. Could you describe to me what kind of business-related issues? Um, I think he was in, in the IT space at some point in time. Um, I think he discussed uh, that with me. Obviously, the consulting space, um, he discussed some of the consulting opportunities that he was uh, looking at, um, but that was it. I, um, I don't recall any others. Can you tell us when you first met Duduzani Zuma? Um, don't recall meeting Mr. Zuma. So you've never met Duduzani Zuma? No. Right. Have you ever met President Jacob Zuma? Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting the President once, um, which was sometime last year after the State of the Nation address, to um, try and um, address the impasse relating to the renewable energy contracts at ESCOM. And at any time during your tenure as CFO of ESCOM, because Transnet will deal with in a separate investigation, did you ever receive instruction that was told, was given to you by President Jacob Zuma? No. No. How would you describe your relationship with Minister Lynn Brown? Um, Ms. Uh, Minister Brown and myself had, uh, I would assume, a cordial working relationship. That was it. I called her, I mean, I've, I never called her. She called me when it was uh, necessary uh, to have explanations of certain things, which I did, and that was it. And then obviously attended meetings or scheduled meetings that was called by her. So cordial, good working relationship. Mr. Singh, I put it to you that you do have a relationship with at least one Gupta, and that would be Rajesh Gupta, who's commonly known as Tony Gupta. And it's also in the public domain, a string of emails that connect you uh, directly to Mr. Tony Gupta. And as I've said, it's in the public domain, and a copy of these emails have also been handed up in Parliament by myself. And I'm going to need you to concentrate here because your answers, I don't want you to unnecessarily perjure yourself because you seem to have forgotten dates and times and places. One of the emails that's in the public domain is an email sent by Ashu, A-S-H-U, at sahara.co.za. That email informs the Oberai Hotel that a one Mr. Anoj Singh is booked in at said hotel on the 24th of February. And it requires a pickup from Dubai International Airport from Emirates Flight EK-766. And you stayed in Dubai for that period of time until 1st of March. So we're talking five days. Now also in the public domain is a series of invoices, which you have now in your possession because our evidence leader, Advocate Renara, gave you these invoices. And these invoices are billed to Sahara computers. 
Now, could you explain to me why there is a, a coincidence that you don't know that Sahara was being billed on these invoices, and yet Ashu at Sahara was making travel arrangements for you to go to Dubai? As I responded to um, Advocate Varana, um, the um, only people that I had communicated with relating to my travel arrangements was the travel agents. Um, and uh, how uh, Mr. Ashu um, came to communicate, I'm not too sure. Now, I understand we all have a private life, we're all entitled to a private life, but we're not entitled to a private life when we're under a, a cloud of state, scap, uh, state, state capture and the possible consequences of billions and billions of rand being looted from our country. Why were you in Dubai for that period of time? As I testified to Advocate Varana, um, I'm not sure relating to the 24th to the 1st of March. Um, I am, uh, I'm not too sure of that date. It seems very long for me to be there in Dubai for five days. My trips were much shorter. And um, as I um, indicated to Advocate Varana that um, some of those trips were business, some of them were, were private, and some of them were to meet with uh, Mr. Uh, Al-Balushi. So from that perspective, I maybe or it could have been that I was there for, 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 that, for that purpose. And when you were there to meet with Mr. Al-Balushi, Describe who and what and why Mr. Al Belushi is. As I've um, said to uh, Advocate Varana already, uh, Mr. Al Belushi is a businessman in, in the UAE. Um, he ha we met, um, um, and there were common interests associated with uh, me wanting to understand the more uh, workings in, in the UAE. He wanted to understand more workings about South Africa and Africa in general. Um, establishment of businesses here, financial businesses in, in Dubai, um, and that's how we, we, we established a relationship. Now, it seems, and you must understand how this looks very strange. You're the CFO of a state-owned entity that has practically the sole monopoly for energy production in South Africa. We've just heard that you earn, you're in about the 4.6 million rand a year bracket, taking into account perks, etc., etc. Oh. Now, outside business dealings from your attention at ESCOM, is that not rather problematic? Because you're discussing business opportunities with this gentleman. Now, if these business opportunities aren't aligned to ESCOM, wh why are you discussing business opportunities with him? Ma'am, this was in my private capacity. It was not relating to ESCOM in any way, shape, or form, or Transnet in any way, shape, or form. Mr. Singh, yesterday evening, South Africa learned that you resigned from ESCOM. Could you tell me why you resigned? Um, yeah, um, it followed the um, uh, announcements over the weekend. Um, I. Uh, believe that I uh, was appointed at the behest of the um, government of uh, South Africa. Uh, I represent them. Um, and over the weekend, I got to understand that there was a requirement for me to be removed uh, immediately from my position. Um, and I acceded to that request. Um, I uh, lodged my resignation with the company. It was accepted, and uh, that's it. Do you have a copy of your resignation letter with you? Um, not on me, no. Not on you. Do you roughly remember what you wrote in your resignation letter? Um, yeah, uh, basically it said that um, 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 I was suspended, or I was put on special leave on the 31st of July, subsequently suspended on the, uh, in September. Um, we still await any uh, charges or formal charges f uh, following the suspension. Um, but given the uh, announcements over the weekend, uh, we believe that it's in mutual interest for us to tender our resignation uh, in terms of our employment contract. Um, and and uh, I think that was it. And 
they then responded and said they accept that. You've just spoken in the plural. You said our resignation letters. Who else have you spoken to about resigning at ESCOM? Our, no. Yes, now you've just said we, we tendered our resignation letters uh, and I did it in our mutual okay. benefit. I mean, it was between Hannes and myself that drafted the letter, so it's a, it was, that's, that's the reference I made to ours. So in all of this, have you discussed your resignation with Mr. Prish Govinda? Um, nope. No. So no talking to, to Prish. Right. Mr. Singh, let me take you back to the trillion question. It's now the infamous trillion question. And it's a question that I asked. And I asked this question specifically because, quite frankly, I knew the answer before it came to me. Now, you've just described your relationship with Minister Brown as cordial. I have to tell you, when Minister Brown was before our committee, her description of, of your relationship was certainly not one that was a cordial relationship. And your attorneys and advocates have been in this committee the whole time, and, and they, they can con confirm this with them. In actual fact, Minister Brown, in committee and under oath, testified that she had been deliberately misled to provide me with the incorrect answer to my question. How would you answer that? Um, as I said in my, in my response to Advocate Varana, um, Mr. Singh, I want to I explain something. You don't have to keep referring to your answer to Advocate, Advocate Venora, because if I was happy with your answer to Advocate Venora, I wouldn't be asking a question. Okay. So let's, let's just, we, we're leveling the playing fields here. Okay. Okay. No, that's fair. Um, the uh, accusation of um, me being, um, or oh, misrepresentation by myself, emanated when I was on suspension. No one has actually addressed me relating to the purported misrepresentation that I have committed. Um, the board uh, has made that submission to the minister. The minister has made that submission to you. Um, in my responses, um, I explained my understanding of that misrepresentation and where it could have come from. Um, and as I said, I think the uh, the uh, responses that we had given uh, were factually correct to the questions that were asked. Um, the ancillary information that was then removed may have created the confusion. Why do you think that ancillary information was removed? That sounds to me, A, either a complete conspiracy theory, B, a duck of accountability, or C, someone who really had it in for you. Um, I would think that, as I explained, the, the removal was basically to ensure that the response was very specific to the questions, as we've always done in the past. Um, um, I was, I don't, at that time, I didn't think it was anything sinister uh, behind the removal of the information. And as I said, I think, also, I'm not too sure who actually decided that the information must be removed. Right, so this information is removed because you want to make it as easy for me as possible, I'm assuming, to give me a simple and direct answer. And in the removal of this information, the truth is misconstrued, and what you think was a truth now becomes an untruth. How do we deal with the situation now? I think, um, again, um, in hindsight, uh, as I and I don't want to say it when mm. we responded <laughs> originally, but I think in hindsight, uh, maybe we should have not removed the information, or the information should have not been removed. Um, that would have provided, as um, Advocate Varana quite correctly pointed out, it was not my response, it was the response of the Minister to Parliament. Um, and maybe we should have given her the benefit of that information. So, in the answering of this question, you've told us that McKinsey dealt with Trillion, you had very little to do with it. You were just dealing with McKinsey, you were paying McKinsey, they were giving you a service. What they did behind closed doors was their business. They carried on, you carried on, you just made sure they gave you a service, you gave them the money for the service. But what is also in the public domain are board meetings of ESCOM of the 8th of December 2015, in which yourself 
and Mr. Michele Coco approach the board and absolutely encourage a relationship to develop between trillion. Do you remember this board meeting at all? And, and I mean, maybe, maybe to jolt your memory, perhaps Trillion Management Consulting, if we get the full name, TMC, which is a 100% subsidiary of Trillion, maybe that will help jolt your memory if we use TMC. Um, I don't recall attending the board tender committee uh, of the 8th of December, if that's what you're referring to. Uh, I can only assume that the submission that was presented to the board tender committee was the um, motivation for the corporate plan uh, that uh, needed to be concluded. Um, so I'm again I'm, I'm speaking on correction, but I would assume that was the uh, submission that was made. But I don't recall personally attending the board tender committee, but the submission relating to the corporate plan that McKinsey was engaged to perform was signed by myself and Mr. Coco. That one, that would have then served at the BTC. But I don't think I personally attended the BTC. And um, also, I think the um, submission uh, basically uh, referred to a 30% subcontract. It didn't refer to the specific company by name, if I'm correct in, 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 that, in, that, uh, in that assessment. Um, and McKinsey um, um, and decided on their subcontractor, and I think that was when the um, subcontract between McKinsey and Trillion relating to the corporate plan was consummated. So at this point, I mean, now you must acknowledge that you knew that ESCOM was, was in some way engaging with Trillion. Oh, yeah. They, I, I've never denied that ESCOM was engaging with Trillion. Again, then I must ask you, why would Minister Brown, in a very simple question, and I'm going to actually read you the question, just so that we, you know, we're 100% okay on this. If you just give me a second. My question, have any contracts of engagement been concluded between ESCOM and Trillion, and what are the costs involved in each case? The response was a very neat and very simple, none and not applicable. Now I put it to you that you would have to be incredibly devious and have very sinister motivation to think that because you were working with McKinsey, who had subcontracted Trillion, that Trillion was not involved in the mix. Because a subcontractor works for the contractor that you're paying for. Now, the answer should have actually been quite simple. I think, again, um, we answered the question directly and precisely in terms of the question that was posed. Um, so from that perspective, I think it was quite um, transparent in terms of the question that was asked and the response that was provided. You see, Mr. Singh, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. I'm going to tell you that when you are the CFO of a major corporation, you tell the Minister of Public Enterprises that a deal that's going to go over a billion rand is being concluded by an international consultancy firm and that a company called Trillion is being used as their front company to make sure that there is BEE compliance. I think you have a duty, both ethically and in terms of the PFMA, to inform both the board and the minister, and certainly a member of parliament when that question is asked. Noted. You see, Chair, it's not as simple as Mr. Singh would like to make out. Mr. Singh, I think that you are a technical genius. And I don't use that term lightly. Every possible loophole has been found. Every possible deviation made. To the point that Advocate Bud Lender wrote a report on the goings-on at ESCOM. Are you familiar with the Bud Lender report? 
Uh, I have not read it cover to cover, but I am aware of it, yes. Okay. So, let me tell you, and you might want to write this down so you can read it later. Paragraph 67.1 of the Bud Lender Report is revealed that Trillion Management Consulting, otherwise known as TMC, submitted an invoice with reference number ESK 2016-MC01 to you, Mr. Singh, on the 14th of April 2016. And I want to specifically mention the amount of money because it is obscene. 30 million 666,000 rand for professional fees. But that's not where it ends. The Bud Lender con report continues. In paragraph 67.2 and 67.3, it goes on to say that on the 10th of August 2016, two invoices, and I'll give you their reference, ESK 2016-MC02 and ESK 2016-MC03 for the amounts of 100 and 22 million 208,000 rand and 113 million 265,000 rand were submitted by Mr. Govender. Both. Now this is what astounds me. Both were paid on the 13th of August. Now in a company like ESCOM that's not renowned for, for turning around an invoice fast, that's pretty impressive. 10th of August, and it's paid on the 13th of August. Now, where the huge problem and the huge dilemma comes in is that on the 18th of May, an article was published in the New Age, in the New Age newspaper, and it was entitled, ESCOM denies contract with Trillion Capital. In this article, ESCOM spokesperson, Mr. Paiswa, Pasiwe, sorry, categorically denied that ESCOM had any contracts in place with Trillion Capital and or, and this is the important part, associated companies. At the point that this statement was made by the, the spokesperson of ESCOM, did you take it upon yourself to correct him? Because, and with respect, if a CFO doesn't know about invoices coming in and out of a company amounting to this kind of money with a turnaround of four days, there's a problem. So in terms of the turnaround, ma'am, I think there is a paragraph in my statement that deals with that. Um, I certainly don't deal with um, approvals of payments that is done by the uh, Shared Services Center. And uh, when I inquired of the Shared Services Manager as to the turnaround of these invoices, um, he had indicated that uh, the, the motivations that had been provided to him were satisfactory at the time in that the uh, work had been done way back when uh, and due to ESCOM approval processes being board tender committees and reviews by internal audit and so on and so forth, uh, that these payments were quite delayed in terms of the um, expected date on which these needed to be paid. Um, so that's the reason why he, he turned around the invoices quite uh, quickly. Um, the invoice of the 14th of, uh, of uh, April, it was it? Uh, the 30 million invoice. Um, was uh, McKinsey was actually paid in uh, December, I think it was, and uh, this invoice that was then paid in April um, was only paid in April due to the vendor management processes that were being undertaken by ESCOM to register uh, Trillion as a vendor on the system. Uh, and again, that was uh, sufficient for the uh, shared services manager to process that invoice. Um, then those were the payments. Uh, your other question, ma'am? When the spokesperson ah, made the statement, did you rectify um, him? 
I was not aware of the statement that was made by the spokesperson. Um, I, I'm not aware of that article that you refer to. Uh, had I been aware of that, I would have certainly corrected him uh, in terms of the um, uh, statement that he had made, or the comments that he made. Who would the spokesperson ask? Who, who would he go to and say, do we have contracts with Trillion or any subcontractors of Trillion? Who would he ask? Uh, I think at the time, the official response that uh, ESCOM had uh, given out at the time was that we certainly didn't have any contract with Trillion. Um, we certainly, or I certainly didn't give out any impression that we certainly didn't have any payments that were made to Trillion, because that would be factually incorrect. You see, Mr. Singh, this is the nuance and where I think that you're genius is because you almost got it right, almost, to convince people that ESCOM was not contracted to Trillion. But we now know that direct invoices were made from ESCOM to Trillion. And direct payments were made from ESCOM to Trillion. That means, regardless of whether or not you had a physical contract that was signed in front of you, the exchange of money tacitly implied that you had a relationship. Otherwise, why would you be exchanging these amounts of money? No, certainly, ma'am, we, certainly I didn't deny the fact that we had a relationship with, well, not that ESCOM had a relationship with Trillion. The, the relationship that ESCOM had was via McKinsey. Um, and the... Uh, work had been undertaken by both McKinsey and Trillion, there was an obligation to pay uh, both Trillion and McKinsey. And uh, that was a settlement process that uh, then uh, was undertaken. Um, we did receive, um, a, um, um, I would say, an, um, permission from McKinsey to pay uh, Trillion directly. Um, I think it's even their policy for uh, subcontracts to be paid directly. Uh, that is McKinsey's policy. Um, and um, it is ESCOM, there is a process within ESCOM, which I referred to previously, which is a partnering agreement process that allows for subcontractors to be paid directly. Um, so certainly I think there was uh, never an, a, 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 a view that um, we did not pay trillion. Uh, I mean, that would have been just uh, not possible to to contain uh, because the amounts would have been paid. Now, you see, I think you, you've just hit the nail on the head. It's impossible to contain. Yes. So why give an MP an answer that says no and not applicable? Because it's not true. <laughs> no, again, I think, as you say, it's technical because the responses to the questions that were posed were correct. The ancillary information would have provided the additional information that would have then allowed the minister to provide the ancillary information. I think that is a very convenient answer, Mr. Singh, and I'm not buying it. And I don't think many other people are buying that answer either. Mr. Singh, let me tell you, there's a, there's a rather interesting term of phrase, and it's a, it's a code. And that, that code is used by, used by the mafia. And that code is known as omerta. And it's a code of silence. It's a, an agreement to not comply with authorities. And it's used to keep syndicates safe. It's how they look after each other. But bar no form of syndicate, form of mafia, form of crime unit, has ever managed to hold this code of conduct complete. No one has ever achieved omerta. Because someone must always speak because they get spooked or they realize that they were unintentionally brought into a scheme that they didn't know about or it's simply the right thing to do. Now you've been watching this ESCOM hearing as it's unfolded and you will note many people have told us some very shocking stories very shocking stories. Mr. Singh, the one common denominator in all of these stories is you. They have come in and systematically described your involvement with state capture 
in a great deal of detail. And they have not accepted responsibility solely for things. They have shifted, I'd say, about 70% of the blame onto you. And when one looks at the PFMA, especially Section 66 of the PFMA, and when one looks at the startling occurrences over the weekend at ESCOM, one cannot help but wonder, is there not a reason that this omerta was broken? Because the silence is broken. It's over. The game is up. The heist has been foiled. And I put it to you that state capture, especially state capture in ESCOM, which you say you don't think is a real thing. I'm telling you, it is a very, very real thing. And South Africa knows it to be a very real thing. Now, one of your colleagues who will appear here tomorrow, Mr. Mashele Koko, who was also suspended, then reinstated, he's been involved in many dealings that have passed a great deal of blame onto you. And I think, personally, one of the largest is the Tegeta prepayment. And perhaps the fatal mistake was a sense, an, over, an overdeveloped sense of self-confidence that allowed a lie to become the most publicly admitted issue ever broadcast on national TV. And that's when, during a carte blanche interview, Mr. Coco was asked about the prepayment, denied it, and then when he was shown the evidence, he had to admit that it was true. Now, that prepayment could not have happened without you, and that denial, that, that constructed story, could not have happened without your input. Because Ometa only works if you both on the same page, and if you both have your stories together. So I want your comment, please, on why this prepayment was denied and only accepted as reality when hard evidence was given. <clears throat> uh, you're going to have to ask Mr. Koko that when he gets here tomorrow. But It's funny, because I can promise you he's going to ask me to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I, as, as I led evidence, uh, I was not the one that approved. Um, the prepayment was approved by the Port Tender Committee on the 11th of April, requiring me to do three things, which I did, and submitted to the Port Tender Committee on the 13th of April. That effectively agreed that I then uh, signed the security agreement. And that's the only thing I signed. The agreement was actually signed by Mr. Coco. Uh, Mr. Singh, it sounds to me like things at ESCOM work very differently to other companies. Because let me tell you something. It might not seem like a large sum of money to you, but 600 million rand is a huge sum of money. And when you bounce these, these amounts up and down like this, certainly the CFO is consulted. Certainly you asked to look at these things. Certainly no one can make a decision like this alone. Who makes these decisions? How can a decision about a prepayment be made without the CFO's knowledge? Why are they bypassing you? That was one of the reasons why I was relatively annoyed when I found out about the fact that I had to do three things and not knowing about the meeting that happened the night before uh, on the 11th of April. Um, so notwithstanding that, given the fact that we needed to get the uh, transaction concluded, uh, we buttoned down and got the three things done that we needed to do. Mr. Singh, on the 11th of April, because I know you're not remembering dates and, and you can't remember if you were at these meetings, so I'm just going to give you the dates and I'm going to give you the information so that we bypass that, that unnecessary step in the testimony. On the 11th of April 2015, the board tender committee of ESCOM sat in the evening, you were there, and it finalised amongst itself, the negotiations for Tegeta. That was on the 11th of April 2015. And those board minutes are in the public domain. They're out there. So there's no question about them. 
also out in the public domain, is a letter from Tegeta, dated the 11th of April 2015, where it says, it's addressed to Ms. Ayanda, and says, Dear Sir, pity about that, offer to supply additional coal to ESCOM, Optimum Coal Mine PTY Limited. And it says, kindly refer to the negotiations we had in the captioned matter. Blah, 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 blah. This email was sent in the morning. The board only met in the evening. That means negotiations happened outside the ambient of the board tender committee. How do we explain this? Well, in response, firstly, <laughs> I do confirm I did not attend the meeting of the 11th of April that happened that evening uh, because I only got to know about the fact that the meeting occurred the next day when Ms. Daniels informed me that I had three things to deliver to that same meeting. Um, else I would have heard it from the committee itself. Um, in terms of the uh, letter from uh, Tegeta, uh, um, I, I can't explain that. It was not addressed to me. I'm not too sure what the, what the status of that, uh, of that letter is and the negotiations that were undertaken. So as CFO, Chief Financial Officer, you had absolutely no knowledge of negotiations going on with Tegeta, what the results of those negotiations were. You had no input into those negotiations. You had no say in those negotiations. A document was drafted without the chief financial officer seeing it and agreed to, not in your presence. Is that what you're telling this committee? For the prepayment of 659 million? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mr. Singh, in our country, negligence is not a defense. I'm going to end my questioning there for now, Chair, mm -hmm. with one last point. In 2015, you were in Dubai in December. And I just want you, and I, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, because I want you to be honest with me. As we speak, my PIA application to Home Affairs is in because I want to check border control access in and out this country, specifically by you, because I want to make sure that this information is true. In August, you are appointed to Transnet. You're seconded from Transnet to ESCOM, rather. Let's put it that way. You're seconded. In September, President Zuma appoints Minister Zwane. Mineral Resources Minister. In December 2015, President Zuma fires then Minister of Finance in Tlantlanene. Minister Zwane joins the Guptas in Switzerland to finalize the sale of Glencore's optimum to Tegeta. Other Gupta allies are in Dubai and these allies are alleged to be you and Mr. Coco. There is overwhelming and mounting evidence that you are part of an elaborate scheme to break up chunks of ESCOM and sell them off to the highest bidder. I am now beyond the point of believing that you did not know about this and that you did not play an active role in this. I have lodged criminal charges against you because I have known too well that you are a technical genius who would come and try and spin stories here in Parliament. Mr Singh, you know these charges are being investigated. I have given over all the documents. We both know what the truth is. And Mr Singh, given your testimony here tonight, let me tell you what South Africa thinks. South Africa thinks that you have sold us out. You have sold us to the highest bidder. But South Africa has stood up and said, no more. This committee is sitting here telling you, no more. 
The game is up, and if I were you, I'd start spilling the truth. No further questions, Chair. Thank you very much, Honourable Mark.